Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, like she said, uh, I've worked in comic books and all that. I've wanted to be a comic book artist since I was a little boy. And uh, I remember seeing uh, drawing Star Wars battles when I was about three or four in the back of my grandparents' Mexican restaurant. And uh, I saw comics when I was about 13. And uh, I decided then and there I would work. I would be Jim Lee. He's a vice president at Warner Brothers. That's Batman, Superman, DC Comics. And he actually hired me in my 20s. So my dream came true. A lot of hard work. It was either that or defensive end for the Denver Broncos. So the Broncos, sorry, guys, but uh, I got into comics. But uh, what I want to talk to you guys about today is how this stuff is affecting the culture at large, and specifically Second Amendment rights, but just how it's affecting the entire culture. Because it's a holistic thing, how entertainment and story has been weaponized for decades, right beneath your noses. And, you know, I got involved. I worked there. It wasn't that bad. It was a lot of heroic stuff, robots, time travel, just the normal fare for young males to get excited about being a hero. And I noticed it getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And eventually, uh, about two years ago, they put me on the Superman book as one of the artists and they uh, changed the slogan. He has an underage son whose bisexuality is going to be a focus of the story. And I'm just, I'm out of here, guys. So a lifelong dream that I worked for, I said, I can't do this with you guys. You want to do this mess. You want to tell people that, oh, you're black. You can't succeed. You're gay. You can't succeed. That's a hateful thing to tell people. It's a terrible thing to tell people, especially in America, where it's just patently not true. So the, um, since God gave me a gift to write, to draw, to color, to do storytelling for a living, I am well aware of the impact it has on people's psychology. It goes right to that amygdala, the fight, flight, freeze, all that stuff in your brain, the subconscious. When you hear a story crafted by people who have amazing storytelling abilities, they're great actors, they're great writers, singers, dancers, anyone who's a masterful artist they will penetrate your subconscious with their art and they will convince you that this, whatever their message is, is true about the world and you will believe it. And then the Bible says faith without works is dead, right? What you believe is what you act on. So if you believe the white man is the devil and your father's an idiot and all this stuff that they are giving to you in quality entertainment, they're great. They're great artists and writers. They are singers, all of it. You will eventually believe it because you're soaking in it. Persuasion is like alcohol. It works on you whether you like it or not. You say, ah, oh, vodka, you're not going to fool me this time. I'm not getting drunk and drink the whole thing. It works whether you like it or not. And persuasion works whether you like it or not. So if you fill your head with evil, well, then that's what's going to eventually start coming out of you. So I do comedy too. I do a YouTube channel. I have a new show launched with my friend, a Navy veteran, Jericho Green. He's hysterical. One of the best improv comics I know. I do a lot of comedy too. And uh, we saw that news story yesterday about the guy. He crashed his semi-truck somewhere in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, it was dangling like a Hollywood movie. I didn't know a semi could really hang off a bridge like that. I thought that was only movies. And uh, the paramedics, the firemen, the rescue team, they all came and saved him on a crane. Welcome, friend. And uh, I joked on Twitter. I said, I wonder if the trucker in that cab was like, oh, well, they better, they better not send a white guy to save me. It better be someone diverse. Or was he like, please, whoever's the best at this, get me the hell out of here. So here's a little bit of improv from our YouTube show, uh, Datitude. We do a lot of improv comedy where we're, uh, we're addressing that issue. And then after that, uh, we'll go into why story so important. That speaker better be on. We'll find out. We might have to fix it. Here we go. If we don't hear anything, we'll start over. Okay. What would happen if the man dangling from this truck wanted a diversity hire to save him instead of whoever was most qualified? Datitude investigates. Hey, excuse me. Yes, sir. Are yeah. you all right? Are you alive, sir? I'm good, but before we get started, I need to know. Yes. What are your pronouns? What? What? Do, what do you mean? I'm here to rescue you. Is is the is the cab stable? I'll go first. He, him, yours. What are your pronouns? He, who? What are you talking about? Is, is the window? Is it cracked, sir? Yeah, the window's fine. Are there any people of color up there who can rescue me? I see a lot of cisgender white males. Well, well uh, my name is Eric. I'm uh, I'm Irish Italian. Um, Julio is Dominican. I think that's like black and native Islander. I'm not sure. You want to talk to Julio? Send down Julio. I don't want to be rescued by a cisgender white Trump supporter. I, sir. The cab is swaying, and I think I hear the glass cracking under your butt. Are you sure you want me to get Julio? 
I know it's swaying. I've already shit my pants. But I do not, I repeat, I do not want to be rescued by a cisgender white male. Ew. Sir, I, I've been doing this for 17 years, successfully rescuing people from emergencies. Julio has been here for two weeks, hired on our diversity program. He's a nice kid. I think I should do it. I'm coming down, all right? No, stay up there. You are clearly over six foot with muscular definition. I need a diversity hire or I will die. Listen, Captain, listen, this guy doesn't want me to come. I know. I, he, he, he wants Julio. Julio. Julio's not here. He called in hung over again. Gosh, fucking damn it. Hey, listen, Julio's not here right now. I got to come down. I could see it fraying. I could see pieces of glass falling out of the cab. No, let me die. <laughs> Unless you have a DEI hire, I will die here. Thank you. Uh, well, can you at least give me your wife's phone number so I can let her know that this was your choice, sir? You mean my life partner. I do not want to use archaic titles like husband or wife. She is my partner. We are equal. Actually, she's better. Sir, it's the, the cables are disconnecting the cab from the trailer. Sir, please. Call her my life partner or let me die. Oh, my God. It's falling apart. No. <laughs> and see. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Splash. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, you send me you rest send in me. peace, rest in power, friend. <laughs> you sent me whoever the fuck is the best at their job, and I will gladly, you know, this is one of the rare times in life that I will embrace. Okay, so that's very funny, right? But here, here's where it gets sinister. We have a lot of fun with that. You see, Jericho and I, we're great comedians, and we improv that. We just made that up as we went along because we have those skills. We've worked on them forever also a gift from God to be able to improv like that but you go oh that's fun it's entertainment well the message we got we do it so well with our skill it goes deep in your subconscious and you feel it because it feels true because what art is about is about truth your brain is a pattern recognition machine and when you recognize a pattern you get dopamine you actually get rewarded by your brain because in the old days if you recognize that was a tiger and not a bush you got to live another day so that's why art is patterns and that's why it makes you feel good so when we do our comedy and we do it well, you feel good, but we sneak in our message to you. So now we've ridiculed diversity, inclusion, hiring, and all that, and we've done it very well. So this is why all of this diversity stuff in movies and comics and all that is so evil. Because I worked there, Disney, Warner Brothers, for the better part of 15, 20 years, and I know what they're up to. I talk to the people, the managers, the editors. I know exactly what they're up to. And to be fair... Most of the people that work there are normal people. They have families. They just want to live. They want to pay their mortgage. And they like art. But the people who are rabid socialists and communists, there's just a few of them, but we know how that works. They're bullies. They're psychopaths. And they cancel and they get their way. And most people, you're on a subway and some guy's going crazy and screaming, throwing stuff. Most people just put their head down and go, oh, my God, when is he going to stop? Almost nobody speaks up. And that's how it is at these companies. So that's why you get British history the Lord of the Rings, with this black lady leading, you know, part of the show. There's nothing wrong with black people. I, my dad's from Africa. I'm African-American. And uh, they have great, rich tradition and stories there. Let them tell those stories. Don't take the European history and turn to that. And then in the middle, you have Marvel Comics. You have Spider-Man. Iron Man. Like, oh, no, now we have a girl boss. And, of course, the white man is the villain. And the black guy is her sidekick or whatever. And then on the left there, that was the book that I was working on. I said, I got to get out of here. That's underage Superboy with his gay boyfriend. It's like, why are we... And it's not that they're gay. I don't want to do comics about the sexuality of anyone, let alone underage people. That's not what I do. That's not what I stand for. I don't want to be in my office drawing, coloring, writing. Uh, my kids or my grandkid comes in, oh, a grandpa has to cover the drawing board. Don't look at what I'm doing. I don't want to be ashamed of what I'm doing. And then I definitely don't want to put it out there for other people to see. So that's what's going on here with this stuff. That's what got me to get away from this lifelong dream of mine is they want to start pushing this. And, what, and I'll explain to you where this ideology comes from in them and then what we can do about it. So right here, we all know post-World War II, whatever, Superman's slogan is truth, justice, and the American way, right? But of course, when they relaunched this new book they asked me to work on, 
Um, we're going to focus on the sun sexuality, and we have a new slogan. And, and what, is, what is that? Why would you make a new slogan? You know what I mean? And to me, identity politics, what are they based on? Well, a, good, uh, a friend of mine, Shantan Jetty, a great artist, and he's another comic creator. He walked away from working at woke universities, and he put it to me one night. We were talking about this concept, and he said, it's a culture of resentment. And when he said that to me, it's just like, oh, my God, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's why they want to tear down such beautiful things. Um, so what they do, communists, it's called the slow march through the institutions. This is what they say that they do this. These are 100-year plans. They infest your governments, your churches, your universities, all your art, because they know story. That hilarious bit I showed you, me and Jericho, that's storytelling. And when they can in, in, infest those things and control them, they can get through to people and brainwash them for decades and eventually have them saying things like socialism and communism are good when it was the most evil thing of the last century, killing hundreds of millions. You know what I mean? So th this is what they give us. Now, you look at these things. I liked The Simpsons when I was younger. I wasn't allowed to watch Married with Children. Thank you, Mom. I, didn't, I was too young for Archie Bunker, but these are well done. They're well acted. They're well written. They're well animated in the case of cartoon. But ultimately, the message here is quite evil. It's very sinister. Because, again, it's that pattern recognition thing that you guys are all primed for, the way God made your brain. You're seeing these patterns, great actors, great writing, great jokes. But the story is father's an idiot. Uh, Al Bundy hates his wife and kids. You know, and this guy's uh, uh, everything and everything traditional is wrong and racist is basically the message of the gist of this show is what I got. I haven't seen much of it. But the clips I've seen, it's like everything traditional with America is wrong. And he's a dinosaur and doesn't know anything. And what they want to push is everything that will destroy you, right? They want to push every vice. And vices feel great. There's a reason people do drugs and get drunk and do all these things, because it feels good, of course, but there's going to be a cost. And they know, they, elites, whoever it is, pushing this stuff, the, ultimately the devil, but pushing this stuff, if they can destroy you and keep you down and especially destroy your families, then you'll just be a tax-paying cattle for them. That's all you'll be. You know, they'll just keep you drunk, keep you numb, keep you stupid, and they'll push all this stuff on you, where you have no substance in your life, no love of family, no love of God, no love of country. So you just have to leap from one dopamine hit to the next. Oh, I got to get the jalapeno poppers. Then I got to listen to this song I like. Then I got to go here. Then I, and you're just trying to survive because you're actually miserable. This modern world of emptiness, it gives you nothing. It's just vapid. It's nothing. You know, they would paint about this in the Renaissance. Those, you know, those still lifes you would see, there was a whole class of them called vanitas. It was Latin for meaning vanity, meaning just emptiness. You know I mean? There'd, and there'd be a skull usually and stuff like that. And it was just telling you that, this world, these worldly delights, if that's all you seek, you're just going to need them every two seconds. There's a reason it's called instant gratification because that's how quickly it's over, you know? So, and again, so you, you add all this stuff up, right? And then you end up here. Your economy is ruined. Families are in shambles. They're just crumbs on the ground. Uh, I think I read a thing yesterday analyzing Anheuser-Busch. They're the ones that own Bud Light, right? has lost over a billion dollars with their masterful marketing there. And uh, the reason this stuff is starting to boil up and come through into the culture is because of this stuff here. That we've spent decades just baking this into people's minds and hearts, and we've got to do something about it. And shame on patriotic conservative Christian people, because I grew up around them, that's, uh, that's me, and they hate the arts by and large. Not totally, they reject it, get a real job, the arts are stupid, and guys, that is the dumbest thing we've ever done. Frank Capra, director of uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and of course, the greatest movie ever made, It's a Wonderful Life. That's the Hollywood we should still have. We could have it. There's nothing wrong with art. God made art for us to praise him and to make it, and, and conservatives just got away from it. They're like the people in Footloose. Dancing is evil. Music is evil. No, it isn't. It's worship to God. When I make what I make, it's worship to God. That's what I'm doing. That's why I refuse to make their filth. You understand? We should be raising little artists and actors and singers because it's that void will be filled, and it has been filled, and it's a disaster. And for conservatives say, ah, crazy liberal Hollywood. No, it should be Frank Capra's beautiful all-American Hollywood. And we gave up on it, but we can, we can turn this around. Okay, here's a recent example. So I worked on, there was a hit video game in 2009 called Batman Arkham City. It was a huge number one seller. They made multiple sequels. It's been a hit video game. Uh, my friend Carlos did all the character design. 
And now they made a new sequel, like the fourth or fifth sequel, and the game has utterly failed. The sales are bad, nobody's playing it. And it's because a woke consulting company now does a lot of consulting in video games. These people have no talent, they're just moral scolds and they're socialist, communist weirdos, and they come in and they take all the beauty away, all the masculinity away, all the adventure away, and it's all about hating your father, hating his culture, hating tradition, and, that's, and the game is called The Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League. So think of the concept there. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, all these iconic American, uh, our, our, our cultural patrimony, they destroy it. They literally kill the Flash and pee on his corpse in the game. This is what they're making for kids. You know, the Superman's villain. That's, it's like everything, father is, it's this again. Father is wrong, father is an idiot, right? So they've infested these industries. And it's nice to see them fail. The game is failing. So this was me tweeting at them and telling them to enjoy their failure. They've, they've earned it, you know, and, and they make all the women ugly. And there's nothing wrong with female beauty. Like it, it exists for a reason. Sorry, I didn't mean to close that. This was the game when I worked on it. We would make the characters beautiful and stuff like that and celebrate beauty and adventure and excitement. And, and now they make them all man jawed and flat chested and ugly and everyone has a rotten attitude. And uh, here's an example. Japanese game developer on the left and an American, those are both women, by the way. So this is what they're doing. Anything you like, anything that's important, anything that's gotten us to where we are, they hate it. Now, I've hammered that point a bunch. Let me jump ahead here because I want to show you where did it go. Oh, man, where did I put that one? Oh. I don't think I have it here. I'm sorry, guys. Um, well, the, I saw, uh, I'm going to have to just visually describe it to you because I'm not going to look it up right now. Um, it was a picture, you pictured your mind, okay? Quarterback, cheerleader, kissing, right? He's won the game. She's beautiful. She's thin. He's muscular. He's cool. He made the winning tackle, whatever. And the way you react to that imagery says a lot about how you were raised. Normal people will see the cool linebacker guy, quarterback guy, and go, huh, how do I get like that? What, I got to lift weights, I got to show up early, I got to eat right, I got to be disciplined, got to keep my grades up. See the beautiful girl, girlfriend, like, oh, okay, how do I get like her? What's she doing? What's she up to? What's her whole routine and this and that? Communist, socialist people, they're resentful. And they say, I hate those people. I hate what they have. I'm jealous, and that should be mine. Why do they have it? I should have it. And that's why they want to destroy your things. That's why they make, that's why they turn this into this. That's why they turn Superman into a criminal. That's why they do these things because th that's why they turn Superman into this. Because they hate that it's good. They hate that something has been achieved. And it's this culture of resentment that my friend put it so well. Because they, and, and why? Let's, let's go another step further. Why is there a cultural resentment? Why can't these people gain skills, work hard, and achieve anything? Well, I'll tell you why. It all comes down to one thing and one thing only. Fathers. Families and fathers. Fathers do a thing for children that mothers cannot do. They can't do it. I won't hear otherwise. We know it. We see it in the world. Fathers give you validation. Your mother, what's the saying? A face only a mother could love. Your mama loves you for free no matter what. You see a criminal on the news. My baby didn't do nothing wrong. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Your mom loves you. And it's a beautiful thing. It's God's design. That's how mothers should be. Nurturing. I love you. She carried you in, in her. She fed you. Of course she loves you different than your dad. You know, those of you that have dads, you know how dad is. He says, no, that's not good enough. We're better than that. You could do it. You know, uh, there's a boy here in town, uh, Casey Granfers. He was nominated for the Silver Pigskin Award when he was a senior playing football at uh, University City High School. Got a Division I scholarship to UC Davis. I've known that kid and that family since they were this little. His first day of tackle football, 2008, I was one of the coaches, La Jolla Country Day football over there, the Pop Warner. And an hour into practice, we're running around the field, and he's sobbing. He's never played football before. No, no big, scary men have yelled at him and made him run and fetched enough water. And he's crying, and he wants to quit. And I want to go home, and he's just sobbing. And I calm him down. I stop him. I get low. I talk to him. I say, hey, buddy, you can do this. It's okay. If you can't run around this track, I'm going to run with you. I said, and if you come back tomorrow, I'll come back tomorrow. I said, every day you're here, I'm going to be here. And like I said, he grew up to be a star player in San Diego, playing receiver, quarterback, safety, all over, Division I scholarship. Can you imagine if he started crying when he was little and they said, you know what, go home, maybe it's too hard for you. This is what men and fathers do. There's a reason, there's a very distinct reason they go after men, right? There's a reason for that. There's a reason that toxic masculinity, there's no such thing as that. The only thing that's toxic about being... Uh, a man is when you're not a man, when you're weak and you're hysterical. That's toxic masculinity. 
when you don't know how to lead, when you don't know how to self-regulate, when you don't know how to control yourself. And again, this is what story brings you. Jesus spoke in parables. If stories are good enough for Jesus, they're good enough for me to give. And that's why I don't want to ever give anyone evil stories. But you see the beauty of that. Of We all know that as boys. All of you can think right now of a, a boss, a coach, a dad, an uncle, a, your drill instructor, whoever. He wiped the snot off your face. That helped you wipe the blood out of your mouth. Said, You're better than that. You can do this. And, and this is a thing I think unique to men. I'm not a woman, so I can't speak to that. But we have to go through the fire and understand we are capable of so much more than we ever thought we were. I remember my high school football coach, Bill Christopher, great guy. He was a psychology teacher too, so he would really get into us in a good way. And we had a thing where if you could lift a certain amount of weight, you would get a t-shirt and it said it and it had a football player on it lifting. And uh, I was 15 years old and it was 235 pound hang clean. You know, there's 300 pound bench, 400 pound squat. You get these, and I, my wife is there, you can ask her, I still have these old shirts with holes in them in the bottom of my drawer. Don't ever throw them away. How dare you? Divorce. You don't throw those away. And uh, I go up to coach and I tell him, I think I could do 235. You know, and it's like 70 kids in the weight room, Rancho Verde High School. And he tells, hey, hey, I'll tell you he's going to go for 235. And they just start frothing at the mouth and screaming. And you do it. And you have to do five. And when you finally do it, you feel like you, feel like you can do anything. And we've lost that in a culture. We've lost that completely because we've lost fathers. Because people have been told for decades that fathers are terrible and stupid and that family is dumb and you're this individual do whatever the hell you want all the time pleasure is the only thing that matters in life well it's gotten us this far does everybody like this does everyone like what's going on is this awesome right no it's terrible but we can't just sit there and do nothing about it so here's a wrong one there this is just more nonsense um but here it is so about two years ago that's me there in the sunglasses there they ripped that off my Twitter. Uh, it says, artist quits DC Comics over Superman ditching American Romano. It's a bunch of effing nonsense. So they can write that on my gravestone, I guess. Um, but yeah, I got out of that. I, I saw a clip on Fox News. It was very funny. They said uh, that um, Lex Luthor, Superman's enemy, should send DC Comics flowers because they finally killed Superman for him. I thought that was a pretty good jab at them. But yeah, they disgusted me. They were my heroes when I was little, the artists and the people that run that. Heroes to me and uh, just disgusted of what they've done there. And again, it's not just for kids. This, this story, what has ruled the box office for the last 15 years? Superhero movies. People love them. People love heroicism. Look at how the superhero movies have turned in the last five years, where it's all uh, girl bosses and men are stupid and America sucks. Look at the superhero movies now. They can't make any money. They come out and they fail now because we all know whether you're a far leftist or what, we all know what's true deep in our heart. Um, as an artist, this is my favorite painting. This is a Renaissance painting by Jacques-Louis David one of the Renaissance masters, and it's called The Oath of the Harati. It's a Roman legend, the Harati family. Those are the three sons there saluting their father and making it, swearing to him that they are going to defend their territory against this other people that are in, infringing on it. And one of the sisters there in the blue headdress, she's crying because she's in love with one of the men from the other tribe that's going to fight her brothers. So she knows no matter who wins, she loses. But to me, this, this is what I try to base my life on because I know what my father and my grandfather and all the men that came before me have done for me. I know I wouldn't live in air conditioning. I get to be an artist for a living, guys. I work at home and make a lot of money drawing. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't get to do that if it wasn't for amazing people that fought and lived and died for me and kept traditions alive. And this is why art and story are so important. People dismiss this stuff like a bag of Cheetos or whatever. Like it's just, ah, oh, we, we enjoy the TV show and then it's over, like whatever. No, no, no. It, it's going deep into your subconscious. So this is what we need to get back to. And I'm getting back to it, and I'll explain to you how. This is Indiana Jones, 1989. Uh, if you've seen the uh, Last Crusade with Sean Connery, fantastic movie. There's a scene in it. He has to get through all these traps to get to the Cup of Christ. And there's this bridge where it's in perspective. You can't see it. The, the design on the rocks lines up perfectly with the bottomless pit. And it says he has to take the leap of faith, you know, trusting God. He has to step out. And he closes his eyes and he steps and he thinks he's going to fall, but he doesn't. And then they pan the camera and you see, oh, there was a rock bridge in perfect perspective and optical illusions. Fantastic. And I remember when I was quitting DC Comics, when I said, when I said, no more, no more. You live in San Diego. We know what mortgages are here. I have a wife, two children, a granddaughter, and uh, we got to keep the lights on and pay that mortgage. And I didn't have a job lined up, but I will not make this trash with them. I won't do it. 
So I thought of this story when I would pray. I would think of this. I would literally, this specific moment, I would picture it. I would say, God, don't let me fall here. I'm, I'm going to do the right thing. You got to help me. I've been lifted higher. Than way more money, way more success, way more fun. And that's the power of story. This story was made by great writers, artists, musicians, actors, you know, director, photographer. They're all so great that it was able to get into my subconscious. And I was able to remember what heroicism looked like. And even though it's phony and fake and never happened, the subconscious part of your brain doesn't know that. That's why you jump if there's a scare in a movie. Your subconscious brain doesn't know that that's not really an alien. It's just like ah, danger because the pattern recognizer has to keep you alive. So that's why these stories are good. You don't see this anymore almost. You see it sometimes always. I thought Top Gun Maverick wasn't terrible. It was pretty heroic and brotherhood and stuff like that. But they're rare now, these kind of movies. And we need to make them normal. And we need to... We need to humiliate and shame these people, the woke people. We need to. Here's what I said. I, I like this. I'm a bit of a wordsmith. I'd like to think. Sweet Baby is the, the woke consulting company that injects all their nonsense communist politics into video games, just ruining them, making them wrong. I said, you, Sweet Baby, are cultural vandals, and normal people are happy you have been, all have been exposed. Also, you and your commie friends, you could never create quality art that is one scintilla as good as what I've done. When I worked on Arkham, that's the Batman game, it was a hit. I left out an A there. You guys uh, get a hold of it. And like Trump said, everything woke turns to shit. Enjoy your failure, sweet baby. You've earned it. I don't have any problem treating them that way. People say, oh, you got to be nice. You got to do this. You got to do that. I'm a Christian. I do believe in turning the other cheek. But if someone is on top of you trying to stab you, you can defend yourself. That is okay. And they are on top of our culture right now, pummeling it. It's okay to humiliate these people. It's okay to say something back. It's okay to go into the news and go on all kinds of talk shows and talk about this. I've been on so many shows and Fox News and Newsmax and America's, I still do them, I still do interviews all the time. And every chance I get, I take a stab at Warner Brothers and all that and DC Comics all that, because what they're doing is evil, true evil. They're hurting so many minds and hearts and there's nothing wrong with calling that out. And, I, and that thing I told you about, the guy on the subway going crazy and everyone just puts their head down, I'm telling you guys the time for that is over. All of you follow the law always, but speak up. Speak up, because I'll tell you this, even on the left, they don't like these woke people either. Nobody likes them. They are a fraction of our population. They're just psychopathic bullies. And we just have to speak up and tell them to get lost. They can't cancel you. Being canceled is a choice, okay? They didn't cancel me. I left DC Comics, and I'm doing way better now. But you have to speak up. That's how we will get back here. We will start making this sort of entertainment again that will use great artists, and writers and actors and illustrators and musicians to tell great stories, to convince people of this stuff, that the good news is true, that life is a gift from God, that you can be terrified and do the right thing anyway, that you can step into that bottomless pit and God will save you from that. You understand? We need to be getting this stuff into people's hearts and minds because there's no other way to turn this around because they're, con they're controlling all of it. So we got to go independent. So that's what I've done. When I left these companies, I didn't just leave and become a carpenter or something. I continue being a comic book artist, and this is that world I want back. So what have I done? Let me jump there. Well, I'll show you a few more just to kind of give you the taste. Yeah, I'm a Denver Bronco fan. Get over it. I was born in Colorado. But I want to get these kind of messages. They're silly, but that's the sugar that helps the medicine go down. We need that silliness, that aloofness, that Rambo with a gun the size of a truck in his hand. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the cartoonishness is what helps you digest it. You know what I mean? The fantastical, the, uh, that couldn't really happen. No kidding. It's a story. Of course it couldn't happen. But the base truth is true. That's where we need to get. So this is what I'm doing now. This is exciting and fantastic. It's at the printer right now. My good friend, and uh, any of you have ever heard him speak, Mr. Superman himself, Dean Kane. He is a patriot. He is on the, I think, the board of directors at the NRA. He is a uh, deputized sheriff and I think police officer at two different locations. He's a great guy, dedicated father, my kind of guy. He saw me speak out against Warner Brothers on Twitter. And he like, he messaged me and said, hey man, we need to talk. So I called him, said phone number exchange, called him. So what can I do for you, Mr. Kane? He's like, no, what can I do for you? So I want to promote what you're doing. So I had another book I did last year called Truth, Justice, American Way. And it was sort of analogs for Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, my own thing. Super heroic about fathers and family and overcoming evil, evil, selfish people. And in my books, evil is evil and good is good. A lot of modern stuff, it's a very gray line. The good guy is doing cocaine and going to strip clubs, but he's still a good guy. You know, like, what? What are we talking about? Like, so we have good versus evil, and we want to get those stories through. So what I, I was finishing up Truth, Justice, American Way on the drawing board, 
I was almost done, and I was thinking, what do I want to do next? I said, you know, Gene, was there ever a 90s action movie that you didn't do that you wanted to do your dream, like Stallone or Arnold or anything like that? And he said, yeah, I would have loved to have done stuff like that. He ended up, you know, focusing raising his son. He was a single father for the last 20-something years. So he didn't, get, you know, he didn't get to do that. He was, I mean, he was with Denzel right after Denzel won the Oscar for uh, Training Day. Dean starring against him in, was it out of time, right? So he was on that trajectory, but he focused on being a father. He gave up a lot of acting to be a father, which was admirable. I said, well, let's do your 90s action movie. And I, I named it. I wrote it. Like, he kind of helped me come up with the character, but I wrote it. You know, Dean Cain, All-American Lawman. It is so much fun. It's 110 pages, and it's exactly what you think. Horrible, you know, drug dealer guys, helicopter crashes, weird ninjas, and beautiful women. But it's got a good story, good characterization, and good lessons. We don't do gore. We don't do cursing. We don't do sexing. But it's, it's, it can be like Indiana Jones or Star Wars or Lethal Weapon. We're going for that. Huh? Oh, you know what? No, but it does have the same, like the snake twisted, but it does have that look to it. But this, this kind of sums it up here, right? So we put everything we love into these books here. And, uh, and we want, and, and again, that, oh, I'm editing the thing. I shouldn't be editing it. Um, we want to make it a bit like right here. This is an homage to Indiana Jones. Every time Indiana Jones traveled countries, they would show the map and then show the little plane. So I, there's so many little Easter eggs like that in our book, you know? And we're, and I started my own company. Like, okay, DC, you want to be dumb? Well, that's the hat I'm wearing, Big Man Comics. That's why I'm a big guy, so I just named it after me, right? So Big Man Comics, that's what we're doing now. So I'm telling you, when you're facing this stuff in your life, this woke garbage that is ruining everything, you can't just watch it burn down. You can't be, somebody call a doctor. Like, no, you need to do something. Follow the law. I always have to say that. But you need to do something because you can. You can do something. Whether it's just speaking out or just mentor a young boy or coaching Little League and being a good influence on boys. You can do something. You know I mean? That's what we were made to do as men. So that is what I'm up to. So again, to recap, stories are the most important form, the most potent form of persuasion. It's on a scientific level. So the subconscious, it's always influenced by what it hears, if the artists are good enough, and we are. So that's why it's so important to get away from that trash and to start making good things. And that's why I do what I'm doing and continue to do it. I would encourage you all, Follow me on YouTube. It's just my name, Gabe Tape. Go to bigmancomics.com right now. Buy my comics. Support us. I walked away from my dream job. Go buy it. You'll love it. Uh, if you love Romancing the Stone, that's uh, what Kirk Douglas and Kathy. I, when I, it's just God, too, because I called Dean on the phone. And I pitched him the idea, and he said to me, have you ever seen Romancing the Stone? I said, that's one of my favorite movies. So the tone of our movie is that. We have the, the romantic tension between the guy and the girl lead, and, and it's really fun stuff. But we want to entertain. And the theme of that book that I did, the theme of that book, it, he ends up telling his son. We fo there's some scenes with his son who's a volleyball player. And uh, the, the, the theme he tells his son, this doesn't spoil the story, is to be a man and serve God, you do the right thing no matter how terrified you are. He ends up telling his son that. And I'll, I'll just tell you what this little scene here. There's a little three, four page scene in the book about him going to his son's volleyball game. And the son is not one of the starters. He's a younger player and he has to play because another kid got hurt or whatever. And he didn't think he could do it. He was crying at the, ha at the house the night before. And, and, and Dean, the character here, Chris Tanaka is the character, tells him, no, you got to do it. And he does it and he helps the team win. So he tells his dad, you encouraged me. I didn't want to do it. I overcame. I won. That's just a little, that's not what the story's about. The story's about cartels and terrorists and all this stuff. But there's a little four page scene to put that in at the beginning. And that's a true story from my life. And I'll end it on this. When I was seven, I was on the soccer team. And I've always been very big for my age, no matter what. Uh, but I wasn't one of the starters. My mom was not one of those coaches that made her boys the starters. I hate that about kids' sports. And uh, the goalie got hurt. And my mom told me that night, you got to be the goalie tomorrow. And I cried. I said, no way. If I give up the goals, they're all going to blame me. It's going to be my fault. I've never been the goalie. She's like, you're big. you got long arms. You can do it. I did it. Shut them out. We won. And I felt like I was 10 feet tall. So that's the influence that adults, mothers, fathers can have on people. When they tell people, they look them in the eyes and say, you can be more than you think you are. You can be a lot more. And that's what I want to do with my stories. So I think I'll end it there, and I'll take questions if anyone has them. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me ask this question. You brought up Top Gun. You yeah. did well, just because it wasn't overtly woke. Right. It, where's the money coming from? When's it going to run out? Like, why isn't the free market? Correct. Oh, well, that, yeah, there's those ESG funds. Have you heard of this? Yeah. There's those, uh, I can't name, I think it's like BlackRock and those giant hedge fund things. 
they pump money into these companies and say, make your woke trash. If your movie loses money, we got you. So that's an agenda right there. Now that's been exposed. So they're having to try and find other things that claim that money's drying up. We'll see. The, my point is, I don't care because I'm this good. I worked on Star Wars. They don't put you on Star Wars or Superman because you're bad at this, okay? I'm an award-winning writer and illustrator. I'll just make better stuff. And my stuff will be true. People will read it. They'll feel these wonderful, uplifting, exciting messages. And I'll just put them out of business. You know what I mean? That's, all, that's what my plan is. I don't care what they do. They are trash and they're irrelevant to me. So they can have all their ESG money. But if they keep making garbage, people just turn away. Like Disney World is having trouble. Like, think of that. Their theme park is being affected by how their movies are pissing people off. You know what I mean? So um, it's just, we just got to wait them out. But we got to start our own things. Parallel economy. I got my own website. I got my own comics. I go to my own publishers. I work with people with my values, artists, writers, even the lady handling the printing brokerage. She's a Christian too. I don't want to work with people that have a weird agenda. I've had friends that have done conservative comic books and they got kicked off the website where they were hosting their book because someone wrote an article. Oh, he's a racist, this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, he's not. But that's what they do. So as far as that, I don't care what they do. They will go out of business eventually if they keep this up. And we'll just outpace them. We'll do our own thing. Quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that story is the most important thing. Well, right. at least... For persuasion. Right. It's the most potent form of persuasion is story. Is it going away? I've got some experience in education. Right. And I remember one particular group lesson where we were told to speed it up, man, because... TikTok and YouTube shorts and 30 seconds is the the right. attention span these days. Right. And we are expected to fit into it. You can't tell a story in 30 seconds other than, you know, shaking your rump. So right. where is the future going with all this? With that, I don't know. I'm not on TikTok and stuff like that. I would say, just as an outside observer, that needs to be legislated. It's a harmful substance like tobacco or whatever for kids. We don't like kids smoke or chew tobacco. We shouldn't have them on TikTok. I know that sounds a bit... Uh, maybe authoritarian to some people, but look at the outcome. Look at what's happening. Just, you, you know, it's funny. I saw someone saying like a baby, they don't know how to do anything. You hand a baby an iPad and all of a sudden they're like, you know, uh, a hura from Star Trek. They're like working the controls and all that. So this, yeah, and I think it's by design. I think TikTok, Instagram Reels, I think it's very much by design. There's that dopamine hit to keep you asleep. Is it hard to get people to pay for art anymore? Um, yeah, there's so much free art out there. A big part of the sales model for people like me is going on YouTube and Twitter and being funny and being a personality because now AI art exists, all the art is free. So I, as just me as a character, I go on there and then people like me personally, and then they buy the books and stuff like that. But you know, my resume speaks for itself. You can't argue with a resume. I'm fantastic at what I do when it comes to making stories and comics. So that doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt that I actually know what I'm doing when it comes to this. But yes, you do have to be a personality on YouTube and all that stuff. And I do do it. So. You laughed. You saw the, the skit Jericho and I did. We're pretty funny guys. So. Anyone else? I love talking, so ask me something. I have a question. Yes. I what, can't really hear you. Though. What can we do as consumers to protect our kids, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews? How do we expose them to content like this? To oh, you have to seek it out. You're going to have to do work. And do not give money to people who hate you. I don't have Disney+. Plus. I don't have Netflix. I don't have Hulu. I don't, and they're very cheap. I don't have them. Cause I don't want that in my house. I don't have that stuff. I remember like seven, eight years ago, Netflix made a show called like Dear White People. And it was a bunch of like, I don't know, black and brown kids and something, I, I don't know. I didn't watch it cause I don't watch trash, but I, I, I kind of knew what it was. It was a bunch of aggrieved, you know, people of all kinds of colors lecturing white people. And that was a, you know, I canceled Netflix then. That was years ago. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a white guy. But to me, that's offensive. That's horrible. I don't know why you would make stuff like that. You know, so um, don't give money to people who don't like you and research where you can find good stuff. You can find it at my website for sure. And I know what I'm doing. and I deliver quality products. And I deliver them on time. Um, and uh, my friend Dean, Superman himself, he's working with True Play Games. So trueplaygames.com, I believe. They do online video games for kids. And it's Bible-based lessons, you know, patriotic kind of good family-oriented stuff. And there's no outside thing where they're talking to weirdos or child people like child weirdos. They're just playing a game with the server on the computer, just, and they're beautiful, professionally done. It's not some rinky dink thing. And that was what I told you guys earlier, that conservatives walking away from the arts was a fatal mistake almost, because we need to be skilled when we make this stuff. Because we've seen some Christian art and conservative art, and it's, let's be honest, it's bad. Bad acting, bad drawing, bad writing. 
you got to, to be as good as I am at drawing, that's a lifetime. There's a gift, there's an inclination for it, but it's, it's like being seven feet tall. That doesn't put you in the NBA. You have to practice. So yes, I was better than average at drawing growing up, but I still have put in decades of work and we need to raise Christian, conservative, patriotic kind of people that way from little and not think the arts are not worth pursuing because this is tearing society apart. It is, uh, you guys don't, you, you know what's going on. This is tearing society apart, this woke entertainment. Anything else? Anyone? Yes, sir, right there. This is kind of a, what you've described is something we all see. Yes. It's an insidious agenda that's been happening for decades, slowly moving from right. certain destruction of the iconic things that's going on. Now it's in grade school and it is, it's penetrated all the way to the halls of Washington where the politicians at the highest level embrace right. it. They right. get on their knees and pledge allegiance to Black Lives Matter right. in, the hall of, in the Hall of Statuaries. We saw it on Washington. Right. So it's everywhere it's taken so long. I know you have, we have, most of us, competing ideas. It's one thing to have competing ideas to go against this movement right. that the wokeness has begun, whether it's Antifa, which is pro-fascism, right. or Black Lives Matter, or just the he-him thing. Right. You have a competing idea. Right. But this bell has already, you, you can't unring this bell. You can't. You can't, and, and it's still ringing. So just summarizing all that, like I just did, what, what can be done if you have any idea of taking the bell away? You butt how do you, hell out all how do you stop them from you ringing light this them. bell right in our face? You bud light the hell out of Do not give them a penny. You understand? You bud light these people. Bud light changed their act, didn't they? They're now the official sponsor of the UFC. What is more macho than that, right? Uh, Shane Gillis is a very unwoke comedian. They're doing a campaign with him. They've got Peyton Manning and his brother slinging their beer because they are terrified because people said, I'm not drinking that. I don't drink beer, period. But you shouldn't do it. And you can do that to Disney. You can do it. The wallet is king, right? So close the wallet. Say it again? Seems like it's not, though, because they're getting away with it for years and years and years. And it gets Well, because people are asleep. People didn't realize. It's been exposed now. It's been exposed, but you got to have principles. You got Look what I did. And I'm not saying I'm a hero, but it's, uh, I say it to say it's easy what I did. I worked my whole life to work at DC Comics, and then I just quit. I made six figures there, and I just quit. And I didn't have another job. But it mattered to me to have principle. It mattered to me that my dad and my dad's dad and so on and so forth have died for me for thousands of years, living in just horrible conditions. My dad's from Libya. We, I don't know my family there because a socialist dictator would murder my dad if we ever went to visit. Because my dad spoke out against him in the 70s. They killed my dad's friends. And I don't want that for my kids. I don't want socialism here for my, the, my future people. But I know the people in my past that I don't even know these people. They loved me. How did they love me? By dying for me, by suffering for me. I can't pay them back. So now there's an imbalance in my mind. So the way I fix it is I build the future for the people in my line, my blood, that I don't know and will never know. I do for them what was done for me. And that's why it was easy to just quit working for Warner Brothers. It was no question to me. So. Oh, yeah. She's got to cut me off. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for coming. It was a delight.